it was one of those was one of those years where many things happened and one of them was the big demo where we the mouse was first shown to the uh, most of the world and many other things but the very same year was the first great pen-based system called Grail and, a, and the first great pen-based pointing device. And also, and I think at the very same conference, uh, the first uh, virtual reality system was shown in 1968. And as was mentioned earlier, uh, this idea of a personal, uh, very mobile tablet-sized computer for everybody, but especially to include children. So it was the idea is to have it be as much like a book that you learn in childhood as an automobile you might learn later in life. But I'm going to concentrate on the Engelbart ideas and the and the big demo and also why we need to understand what Engelbart was trying to do because as we'll see the concentration on the technology on the mouse and the video conferencing and so forth uh, kind of got in the way of people understanding what the bigger ideas that Doug was doing and here's the uh, here's the hall where the demo was done, about 2,000 people or so fit in it. Here's where I sat to watch the thing. And you can see the screen is enormous, but there is a video projector that cost about a million and a half dollars that could show well, this. Right. I'd like to go to produce, but I'd like to go to produce. They get big. I'd like to say one branch only. And, uh, so that was what things looked like during this demo, and they showed many things. They had this way of interacting, as you can see, that was a little nicer than what we have today because it allowed you to keep your hands on the navigation device, which is the mouse here, and also there is this key set that allowed you to... Uh, in combination, just fly through this information space at very high rates of speed. The, the regular keyboard in the middle was used for typing lots of text, but you didn't need it for typing small amounts of text. So this is a very efficient interface. And here, are, I'm just going to show you a couple of things from that demo to give, to give you an idea. Well, I can say, all right, I'd like to go to produce, but I'd like to Go to produce, they get big. I'd like to say one branch only. And uh, let me look just that low when I see it. Oh, I can say, I'd like to see one line only. I can see it. But there's another thing I can do. There's a root I said I have here. So here, I'm afraid I'll need a different picture of the view. <laughs> so here's what I drew with a picture drawing capability. Here's a slight map if I start from work. And here's the route I seem to have to go to to pick up all the materials. And that's my plan for getting home tonight. But if I want to, I can say, the library, what am I supposed to pick up there? I can just point to that. And oh, I see, overdue books and all. Well, there was a statement there with that name on it. Go back. What if I, what am I supposed to pick up at the drugstore? Hmm, I see, they're interesting. All right. Market can do things if I want to just say, I'd like to interchange produce and canned materials. Bingo. So many, many things there, including hyperlinking and uh, what we call word processing today and, and so forth. Uh, the problem with looking at this today is the system was quite a bit more capable than most of the systems we use today. The only thing that wasn't as capable was how good the display looked. So here's another example uh, uh, later in the demo. Set it up so 
I see it over like that, that leaves a corner up there, and I say, now, computer, do the automatic switching that'll bring in a camera picture from the camera model of this camera. I don't know. That's great. Now we're connected audio. You can see my work. You can point at it, and I can see your face, and we can talk. So let's do some collaborating. Pull off to a, a directive file and see what the directive is. So that looks like what we're doing right now, except consider this. Uh, and actually, I'll say this in a, in a little bit. And here's the last thing is when they had meetings, they had the meetings using this system as a shared blackboard. Because not only could you share with one person, you could share with a lot of people. And everybody had their own little pointer on the screen. So this was not like Google Hangouts, where you have to fight over the, the pointer. Your, your hand was extended into this shared system. Now, we have to ask ourselves, uh, what are we doing here right now? Well, we're not doing any of this. We're actually doing something that would be quite familiar 100,000 years ago to, uh, to cave people. And uh, you came, for, even though I'm doing this from London, for some reason you came to this room that you're sitting in. And I am beaming in, but basically I'm, you're sitting around a campfire and I'm telling you a story. So this is something that would be completely recognizable to everybody. Now, about 5,000 years ago, this relatively recent technology called writing was invented. And it happens that writing is much more suited to what I'm going to try and explain to you. Why? Because you can read it at your own pace. You can go forward and back as you choose. And if you don't understand something, you can check it out. You can't do this right now because I'm just talking and talking and talking and so forth. And even if you go back and look at the video, it's not as efficient in, for ideas as this stuff is. But we're not doing that. Um, well, we could be using something like the Engelbart system. In this case, from 50 years ago, you would be able to share, and I could manipulate stuff. Right now, I can't pick up this text. I can't do anything on the screen here because PowerPoint has walled off the system from me. It's imitating uh, transparent plastic slides like uh, we had 50 years ago. It's not doing what a computer can do. So this is crazy. So we're not doing that. All of you have uh, iPhones. So we could actually be sharing this presentation right now. And I could say, OK, go look in this and try this thing out. And you could be trying things while I'm talking. But the iPhone doesn't allow that. And so we're not doing that. So we're not doing any of those things from 50 years ago. And what I want you to do is to ask yourself, what else could we do, be doing today? Some of the underlying technology is much better than we had 50 years ago. So one way of looking at this is writing is still in the future for most people. They learn it in school, but they don't really use it. When it comes to discussing something, they don't do it in writing. They come do a meeting. Uh, the Engelbart system from 50 years ago, most of it is still in the future. You only think you have stuff like it, but you don't. And then there's stuff that Engelbart didn't think about. So almost everything about what I'm talking about here is still in the future. I'm just referencing this genius from the past. And my friend and colleague, Brett Victor, who I think is the most brilliant young thinker about these things today said when Doug passed away, he imagined these writings about and uh, 
pieces in the newspaper about Doug, what you're all about, the mouse and stuff, as being like journalists interviewing a great writer like George Orwell and only asking questions about Orwell's typewriter, forgetting to ask Orwell what he was thinking about and how did he do it and all that stuff. So this is a, a kind of stupid fascination with the technology uh, and avoiding the ideas. And this used to upset Doug. People always were talking about the mouse and he said, hey, the mouse is just like a, a knob on a car radio and we made a whole car. We showed a whole car in 1968. The demo was 90 minutes long. Don't worry about the mouse. Worry about the other stuff. They showed some of this, but what I want to talk to you about today is not the stuff that was in the demo, but what was behind the demo. Because the demo is distracted from these really big ideas, not about cars, but about thinking vehicles for humanity. So this larger idea, not a specific car, not a plane, but the idea of vehicles and the idea of thinking and what does that mean in the future. And the reason for this is a lot of the things that people have said were invented and shown for the first time in this demo, not even close historically. So the first interactive computer, like the ones that we know about today, uh, goes all the way back 17 years earlier to the early 50s with Whirlwind at MIT. And you can see there's a display here and the first pointing device, which is a thing like a gun you held in your hand called the light gun. And a few years later, this was turned into the air defense system with enormous computers, with uh, each with tens of people uh, in the uh, coordinating and working collaboratively. And this whole system actually became the uh, the air traffic control system of the uh, of the world. That's what we use it for today. And also in the early '60s was the a, a system that already did some of the things that Doug had predicted earlier. So this is the invention of interactive computer graphics, object simulation. Many things, icons, windows, clipping, zooming, CAD, computer-aided design, and so forth. And a year later was a 3D version of this with multiple windows. And the machine I think of as the first personal computer, which is called the Link, happened in 1962 also. And this super high quality stylus pen-based tablet was invented uh, in 1963 as well. And so there was a lot of technology going on there. So why are we talking about Engelbart? And the answer is that in 1962, he wrote this proposal called Augmenting Human Intellect, a Conceptual Framework. And it's big. So 144 pages of ideas. Most people who are even interested in Engelbart have not taken the trouble to read this because they think that somehow watching the demo, uh, they won't have to. But in fact, this has many, many more ideas than they were able to do in the demo and many more ideas than we still do today. So my goal for this talk is to uh, get you to read it. Here's the, if you type augmenting human intellect, a conceptual framework PDF into Google, you will get the link for this and you can download it and, and look at it. I'm going to try and explain a couple of the points of view that Doug had 
and try to explain one of the main ideas. So to understand this, we have to go back uh, into the 40s when Doug was a young man as a radar technician in the Navy. And it was there that he uh, first saw cathode ray tubes. This is before the age of television for most people. And on these radar scopes, we're not just signals, but also th symbols, things like letters and, and numbers, and a general feeling for what the situation was. So it was a combination of three things. And from that, he got the idea very early that machinery in this kind of form could be used to display information. And while he was in the Navy, he read this article by Van Iver Bush about a proposed system for the future called Memex. It was built into a desk. It had multiple screens. It had a stylus and a pointing device. It had a scanner. It had keyboards. And inside, it had enough optical storage to uh, the size of a small town library, about 5,000 books worth. And you could find things and you could link things. And the idea of hyperlinks actually goes back to Bush's article. And that really seized the imagination of Doug Engelbart and many other people who saw this at various times. I didn't see this, I was only five years old in 1945. I didn't see this until uh, uh, 10 years later or so in the 50s. And in the 50s, Doug had now was now out of the Navy and he went to graduate school at Berkeley. And the project there was about 25 students and a couple of professors to build an early digital computer from scratch. And here it is as of 19. 50. And from this, Doug learned a lot about uh, not only how computers work, but he got a much stronger idea of how you could make them do things through programming. And during this period, we're in the middle of the Cold War, and he just uh, served in military service. And so he started he worried about the situation of the world. What is going to happen to the world? And he thought, shouldn't I start trying to do something to help it? And these, this was in his mind. He may have seen this quote by Einstein. We cannot solve our problems with the same levels of thinking that we use to create them. So this is from more than 50 years ago, but I think it's even more important for us to understand this today. And the thing that goes along with this statement is what if our thinking abilities are too weak for to understand us to understand our thinking abilities are weak? So our politicians in Washington have this problem. They act like they know what they're doing. And so they haven't gotten to a stage where they realize what their limitations are and what they should do to, to help their limitations. And so a good heuristic here is to automatically, you know, the first thing you say is, my thinking abilities are weak because I'm a human being. I can hardly think at all. Now, what do I have to do to really understand how weak my thinking capabilities are? And that takes a lot of work. You have to learn a lot to understand just how bad you are. And once you do, then you can start looking at ways uh, that you might be able to improve your thinking abilities and other people's. So one of these ways is to read a lot of books. And these are some of the books that Douglas Engelbart read. So many of them are about systems. Doug was a systems guy. 
He thought in terms of systems, and that's one of the things I'm going to try and explain in a couple of minutes, because one of the reasons that most people don't understand what he was driving at is he thought in terms of systems, and he tried to explain things in terms of systems. And the other main area that he read in were about human beings and how human beings make meaning in various ways, including the relationship of language to thought and how we think about what's out there. And of course, how we think about out, what's out there is what science is concerned with. But the map that we have in our head about what's out there also determines how sane we are. And I think you can see that we aren't very sane. Our beliefs are in conflict with what science keeps on finding out. And finally, here is a very important paper, which you can also get online, written in 1960 by the person who set up the big funding in the United States that included the funding for Engelbart, that developed many of the inventions that uh, we use today. His name was Licklider, and this was a paper about what it might be like for a partnership between what computers can do and what humans can do, and both co-evolving together. Licklider was a psychologist, so he used the biological term here, which is two organisms living in cooperation called symbiosis. And Licklider predicted that, he said, in a few years, this combination will be able to think like no humans have ever thought before. And in fact, this turned out to be true, but unfortunately just for science and engineering. The extension of this through education into the American and public in the world hasn't really happened. Hey, I see Abe-san there. Yay, Abe-san. Yay. A great guy, talk to him later. And the other problem with this stuff is that the meanings for systems and the meanings for meaning and the meanings for science are actually new meanings. They don't mean what most people think they are in standard terms. This is, in at least in America, this has confused millions of people. They think they understand what science is, but if you haven't really trained for 10 years and become a scientist, you don't know what science is. So if you use the term science, uh, you're talking about something else. And, and in fact, what has happened over the last few hundred years is even the way words are used and what we think of what a word stands for in science has changed. So here's an example. So here's a thing we call a, a rock in English. Iwa. Does that work in Jap Japanese? I can't, I don't know what the pronunciation is, but I'll just say Iwa. And it's a, it's a thing. And in English, this word not only talks about this specific thing that you can pick up, but it also talks about a class of things called rocks. And this draws a kind of boundary around this idea. The word establishes a category. And that category excludes things that are outside the thing. So when you have a thing, you also have not that thing out there. And that is the way uh, words and thinking and words tends to be used. That isn't the way science and modern thinking thinks about it at all. Because that rock is round. How did it get round? Something must have affected it. So it's actually living in an environment. It has pits in it. How did those pits get in there? Something must have affected it. So 
we have this idea that, oh, this doesn't really have a boundary. It extends out and touches things in various ways. And so it's everything that is denoted as a, as a single thing is actually within a system. And you can't think reasonably about that isolated thing at all. You really have to think about the system. So this is something that's best learned in childhood. And if we look closer at this thing denoted by a single word, we see, oh, it's also a dynamic system. It's not just sitting there. Those atoms in there are jiggling around. Things are happening. It's feeling the outside world and so forth. Now, some languages are better at thinking about things as processes than others. English happens to be really bad. It just doesn't think about most nouns as being in process. They just sit there. So when Doug thought about things, he thought about them in, the, in these terms. And one of the things that Doug talked about in this proposal was how can we improve our ability to argue in a way that makes progress rather than just trying to win? Because arguing can be a great method to help thinking if we learn how to do it right. And the problem with arguments is that they tend to be like stories. They are sequential, one thing builds on another, and there's a conclusion at the end, and human beings judge stories about whether they like them or not. They don't care whether they're true. And if the conclusion of an argument is not what people like, they just dismiss it. It's like a bad story. I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna believe in that. It's like our, our politicians in Washington and the climate. They just don't like those conclusions, so they're dismissing it. And more modern arguments are more complicated. So even less of a story. They can have a thing that is supported by many things at once. And these things can be incorporated in a more complicated form. And finally, we get to this idea that a system itself can be an argument. And I can't give you that argument in a reasonable way in language. Where do I start? It doesn't have a center. So this is something where I need something other. So for example, what if I wanna make an argument about our planet? Our planet is a very complex system. And what I'd like to do is to say something about, hey, we should probably we're probably uh, going to do ourselves in if we don't pay attention to uh, many systems on the planet that are in danger right now. And there isn't a, the arguments that I see in the papers are about, well, this will have economic consequences. Yeah, it'll have economic consequences, but the problem is actually life itself. So here's an, here's an example of a modern argument, which is a simulation. So this is about 100 years of simulation, and the one on the right is what's going on right now, and the one on the left, this is for temperature change, the one on the left is if we held emissions and the amount of carbon in the atmosphere to what we have right now. All right, so about 100 years out, this should convince us, if we understood what the simulation is based on, that we should probably do something right now. We should treat this as a disaster of the first magnitude and start working on it right now. We don't want to wait 100 years until a disaster has happened because we can't put things back together again. So to do this for the general public, we need new languages and new tools, new ways of discussing, new ways of arguing. So these are all part of what Engelbart was thinking about 
56 years ago. And these systems, they're very connected. We can go from one thing to another, uh, but we can pick. This has the same connectivity as what I had uh, just a second ago, but I've picked one to make it the center, and I'm looking at it in terms of all the other things around it. And I can use this to help me think about some complicated relationships. So, for example, here's another way of looking at this. I've changed, made a Venn diagram. So I've changed the red arrows into overlaps. Let's just put a human at the center, because that's where we like to be. And we can look at the relationship of how we've learned to think and do things over the last uh, thousands of years. We start out like all animals, tinkering with things, playing around with things, exploring. Mammals do that. Monkeys do it. We do it. We can make things. But it's ad hoc. It's almost accidental. But thousands of years ago, we invented engineering. And what engineering is all about is to come up with a bunch of methods that work much better for doing some of the things that we've, we've explored. We don't know why they all work, but it's like a cookbook in that there are things that, oh, yeah, this works better. So we'll just we'll write this down, we'll remember it, we'll pass it on culturally. And engineering led to mathematics as we know it today, done a few thousand years ago, as part of what when the big idea, science almost got invented and then did get invented a few hundred years ago. So if we think about this, we explore, we tinker, we find out way, better ways for doing things, we represent these ideas so we can manipulate them more effectively. That's what we're starting to do with computers now. And science is kind of the master set of methods for getting around what's wrong with our brains. It's not the, the reason we're able to find out more about the world using science is because we, we can use scientific methods and scientific instruments for doing things that our brains can't do. And this idea of philosophy, which is a larger thing, philosophy is a way of thinking about thinking and thinking about things that we don't know how to think about very well. And all of these things are inside this really large thing called technology. And most people think of technology as something like an iPhone. But technically, what technology is, is all the things that we make. So when we make language, when we invent writing and so forth, that's all technology. So this is a very, very large area. Now, I've put asterisks on technology, philosophy, engineering, mathematics, and science, because each one of these has a really specific meaning to people who actually do these things. And the meaning is generally a bit different to a lot different than what the general public thinks of each one of these things. There's just something to think about here. If these are special terms. They really should have new names made up for them. So I think we can all see, agree with Doug Engelbart, that our most important technologies are the inventions of these things that help us to think. Okay, let's look at things from the child's point of view now. Children are not born into nothing. They're born into a culture, and thousands of years ago, they were born into a, a hunting and gathering culture, which has thousands of things to learn. It has language. It has stories. And it's tuned to... The brains our genetics make, which are things that are visible, things that are tiny, things that are near us, things that move quickly, things that 
happen soon, things that involve stories, social matters, and so forth. And we see much of this uh, actually operating today. But the baby brought up in France is brought up in something that has a few more artifacts, but it's very, very simple. It's very, very similar, except for the artifacts and some of the ideas about how people treat each other. Very, very similar to a hunting and gathering society. That's still where we kind of are for most, most of humanity. So we're brought up in a culture. That culture becomes our view of reality. What are we actually in? What's invisible here? Well, one way of looking at it, we're in a system of systems, and there are one, two, three, four, five, six things we should really pay attention to. And this way is kind of difficult for people to look at. So uh, we can transform this into a composite picture. It'll give you a better idea. So the baby is actually being born into a whole universe, a whole planet, not just their social system, but many social systems, not just what's around them, but a whole world of technology. This is a self-portrait of the internet, the in, an invisible thing that we're using right now, but that we don't see. And our bodies themselves are whole systems, and our brains are the most complicated known things in the universe, which are very complicated systems, and so we don't understand any of these very well yet. And most adults are never going to wind up understanding them because it takes a long time to do it. So we want to we want to think about, in our program to help the world, we want to think about how can we help children grow up to think better than we can. Or we wind up with something like this. So 60 years ago or so, Doug said, we need to boost our species' abilities for dealing with complex, important problems. And how can we do that? So let's look at tools here. The simple way we think about tools are we got it in our hand and we can do something with it. But by doing that, the tool is doing something to us. We're learning this tool. And when we learn something, when we use something, we learn it. And when we learn something, our brain changes. So the learning and using of this tool is changing the way we think. That affects how we use the tool. That affects how we change. And eventually, we start inventing more sophisticated tools like reading and writing. That was one of the big brain changers of all time because it's not just about helping us remember. It's not just about sending messages. It's about presenting ideas in more powerful ways and learning them in more powerful ways. So that changed our brains tremendously through cultural learning. And what Doug asked is what if we gave this person here something that could tap into these powerful recent ideas of the last few hundred years? like this new interactive computing technology. Could that be a good thing? It's gonna affect us. It's gonna affect us. Can we, can we deal with it? Because we don't wanna give a cave person a nuclear weapon. Oh, a rock is okay. They can't hurt people too much with a rock, but you don't want to give a cave person a nuclear weapon. And this is more powerful than a nuclear weapon. And remember what Einstein said. If we take this new power 
and try to use it with the same levels of thinking that got us into the problems that we're in, we're going to make things much, much worse. And in fact, that is what has been happening in the last 40 years or so since this technology got commercialized. So this feedback loop between humans and artifacts is one of the most dangerous feedback loops to set up, and Doug realized that. So we have to wind up with a new kind of human being, or we've made things much worse. And so here's what Doug proposed. He said, look, we need education and training. Do not let anybody use this stuff casually like people use their iPhones and their laptops. It's not a casual thing. You can do casual things on it, but the effect of it is not casual. The effect of it is enormous. And the problem with tools is that they are terrible teachers. So we need methods. New methods, like I've been talking about. We need new languages, the languages of systems, the languages of science. So we wind up with five things as a system here. And now I'll, those five things together will give us a much better brain than the one we get from just doing a death spiral with technology. Okay, so if we put that into a system here and connect it up, here is one of the proposals in this 144 pages of ideas. We need to make amplifiers. The computer is one of the greatest amplifier ever invented, but we must not <clears throat> put it out in a general way without teaching about it, without new languages and new ways uh, to use it. We need a larger perspective to think about it. And again, like every system, it is connected to other things. It's not just an isolated thing. And in fact, it's the thing that the child needs to have to understand this, these systems we live in and the systems that we are. Okay. So my goal for this talk was to get you to want to go online, get this, and read it. Did I succeed? If I did, type this into Google and you'll get it. And thank you for listening to me. <laughs>